Okay, thank you, Mercedes, for this nice introduction. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity of giving this talk to this amazing group of scientists. I'm, I'm a PhD student from the University of Campinas. And I'd like also to thank Marcos Aguiar, who's my PhD advisor, and all the friends and colleagues and all the collaborators of Marcos Lab. So I will talk about the Derrida Higgs model, which is a neutral evolutionary process, which is zipped to sympatric speciation. So let's talk a little bit about speciation. And species formation process are in the center of biology, and they are important not only to explain the patterns of diversity that you can observe now in nature, but also it helps us to understand the origins of biodiversity and maybe it's possible futures that we can forecast under different scenarios, under different conditions. And so it's useful to classify a speciation according to its geographical mode of speciation. And one side, uh, at, on one side of the zero, there are the allopatric speciation, which is the process of uh, the emergence of species with the interruption of the gene flow due to geographical barriers, such as mountains, rivers, or a piece of land separating two lakes or whatever. And on the other side of the zero, there are the sympatric speciation process, which are those that occur without the complete interruption of the gene flow. Uh, a good uh, definition of sympatric speciation is due to Gavrilets. And it's the emergence of new species from a population where mating is random with respect to the place of birth of the mating partners. It was proposed by Darwin as an important process of diversification. And although it's very contagious process, there are some uh, examples in literature claiming that some species have emerged due to sympatric spe uh, speciation process. And how can we model this kind of process uh, in mathematical ways? So here I will talk about the Derrida Higgs model, which is a neutral model. Uh, so there is no selection mechanisms uh, forcing the diversification. And it shows sympatric speciation. Uh, it was based on spin glasses theory and it was proposed in 1991 by these two guys. And how does it work? Well, we start with a population of N individuals, N identical individuals. And these individuals are defined by a binary chain of plus one and minus one of size B, which is the genome of its individual. Actually, the entries of your binary chain can be any number that you want. So you can choose plus one or zero or the pair of numbers that you like the most. And for every part of the individuals, alpha and beta, we can measure how close they are with this quantity uh, that's called the similarity between the pair alpha and beta which simply counts the number of alleles that they have in common, despite of a, a normalization here. And it's chosen, uh, it's defined in such a way that the similarity among between two identical individuals is one. And how the evolution occurs, it's an IBM process. And we have your population of uh, N individuals. So you choose a pair of individuals, so you have a pair uh, individual alpha and an individual beta, and each one has its own genome sequence, this binary chain, and then they are combined to generate an offspring, so can reproduce, generate an offspring, and this offspring will have its genome given by the, a combination of the genome of its parents. And so uh, each allele can come from parent alpha or parent beta with the same probability, and then it can build this new genome, and additionally, there is a mutation rate. So every allele can flip uh, to the different value uh, with a probability related to the mutation rate. And we repeat this process of choosing a pair n times. And then from one population, we can build a new enti an entire new population. So this process uh, have non-overlapping generations. So generation T generates the new generation T plus one, which will be a, a a slightly different uh, population from the, from the previous one. And so what do we analyze in this model? So the thing that we analyze here is the evolution of the similarity distribution. And here we start with a identical population. So there's a peak at one 
and then it starts to evolve, moving towards smaller values. And at some time, we can see that it finds an equilibrium. This uh, distribution finds an equilibrium. And how can I explain that? Well, for the in infinite case, uh, infinite genome case, we can prove this equation. So the similarity between two individuals of the next generation is given in terms of the similarity of the, their parents. And from this equation, it, uh, we can define an algorithm and then we can run this algorithm and generate all the, the evolution of the similarity matrix between the among the population. And here is something that you can find and we can see that after some time, there's a, a, an equilibrium of this distribution in the system. And we can analytically calculate this equilibrium it's simply take, we simply take the ensemble average of this equation. We can find a recurrence equation for the average value of the similarity, which, is, it's an, which has a, an equilibrium solution. And this is the uh, equilibrium that you can find here. Uh, however, uh, the purely random mating is non-realistic, as also this is not interesting because nothing happens. And so now what we're going to do is to include a minimum similarity. There's, now there's this threshold. And so if uh, a given pair uh, has its similarity uh, above this threshold, they can reproduce, otherwise they can't. So what we have here now is the similarity starts to evolve. It starts to move to, uh, towards the equilibrium. However, at some time it crosses the threshold. And at this point, it's, it's an important point because a, long, uh, a, long, uh, a large number of pairs cannot reproduce anymore. And so something weird happens and we can find from the simulations that this is what occurs. There's the appearance of it, this peaks. And this peak we can relate to a, 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 a species. We can see this peak as a species A, this other peak as species B, and this will have the interspecific similarity between both species. Uh, but why can we do that? And let me try to explain that. And the best way to explain this is through network theory. We can think about the individuals as nodes of a network and the nodes are connected if the individuals can reproduce. So if their similarity is above the threshold. And what the Derrida Higgs dynamics is doing is simply erasing some connections of this network and at some point, there's the formation of components in this network. And then- can, uh, I'm, can, I'm, I'm gonna finish yeah. this and then there is a question. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we can uh, make a, a correspondence uh, between the, the network that you have with the histogram that you had before that I showed you. And so the peaks above the threshold are the connections in, that exists in this network that is still exists in the network and the peak below the threshold are the connections that no longer exist in the network. So what's the question? And I cannot see nothing here. It's okay, Armon, go ahead. I have uh, two questions. If you want, maybe you can answer it after. Okay. You're done. But um, one is, I guess I missed uh, what determines the relative fitness between the genomes. Is it a projection or is it- No, no, we, kind well, of there's no fitness. There's no fitness. It's a neutral process. Oh, right, right. Okay, my bad. Uh, so the, uh, the evolution is, is due to only uh, mutations and, and mating. There's okay. the random grid. So then the time scale of mutations, is that, uh, I mean, relative to the... Yes, it determines the, the velocity. It, it determines when this uh, deformation of these peaks will happen. But it's not uh, something that we is, is studying right now. Okay, because at, at this moment, this is not important. That's what I want to say. Okay, okay, because the only thing I'm alluding to is because, it, I mean, in adaptive dynamics, I guess there's this controversy with sympatric speciation. Yes, and yeah. I, and I, yeah, I just wanted to see if you could comment on that later. But maybe we can, yes, maybe we can yeah, have sorry. a discussion later. There was a question about what these models have to say about speciation in asexual populations, but at the moment, you are having mating, so yes. it does not apply, but I, I think we can discuss later, uh, you know, if you like to answer that later after we see oh, more about them. Okay, 
uh, later we can come back to these questions and thank you. So moving on and here from this point of the, the evolution, we can simply recognize each component as a new species. And why can we do that? Because there's a, a kind of reproductive isolation between these components. So no individual from this, this component can reproduce with an individual from this component. And however, there's a, a new feature to define the species here, and that's the gene flow, because this individual cannot reproduce with this individual, they are not connected, but they are uh, within the same species, within the same component, they have an indirect gene flow here. Well, um, so species appear, and because we're dealing with infinite genome, this transition is really fast, and the distribution is narrow, and the transition is fast, so there's only one condition to define speciation in this process. So when you have infinite genome size, the condition for species formation is simply that your threshold needs to be greater than the equilibrium value, which is defined only in terms of the population size and the mutation rate. So this is quite simple result. Um, however, if you, you want to find uh, infinite genomes in nature, uh, I think you cannot do that, but you, you think that uh, maybe you can try to find large enough genomes. However, uh, when you try to investigate what happened uh, when the genome is finite, a strange thing starts to appear. So in 2016, uh, Marcus Aguiar uh, uh, published this work where, uh, where he investigated this problem of finite genome and he discovered that there is a minimum genome size in order to have speciation. So what's uh, different from what we had with inf infinite genomes. And, and he also discovered that this size of genome is large. So no small values of genome, but this, is, this need to be large. And when, you, when your genome is not large enough, the, so the, your system finds a new equilibrium. So here we can, uh, on this GIF, we can see that for this set of parameters, uh, the equilibrium uh, should, be, should have been uh, one over six, so it's really small. However, the distribution finds a new equilibrium around the threshold. And then you need to increase the genome size in order to have species formation in this model. And um, here we can see the formation of non-trivial structures and the distribution, which are characteristic of the components formation in the, in the network. So it's, it's characteristic of the speci speciation. And there remains the question, what's the minimum size in terms of the parameters of your problem? Uh, or in other words, how large is large? Now, what's the analytical solution of this, pro uh, of this question? And unfortunately, this is still an open problem, and this is the focus of my PhD research. Well, and, and why is this important? Because this is a so simple model, and why should we care about it? And that's because the Derrida Higgs model is a toy model that can build a, a lot of different models. So we can study parapatric speciation, which is a geographical mode of speciation that lies in the middle of that arrow. Uh, we can also study phylogenetic patterns because we can uh, uh, we can save all the the uh, evolutionary history in this process, so we can build uh, phylogenetic trees and then compare with uh, real trees, real phylogenetic trees. We can also study coevolutionary dynamics. For example, in this really wonderful work for, of Deborah and Marcus, they study the coevolution of mitochondria DNA and nuclear DNA and its role in the barcode hypothesis of species identification. And we can also study migration dynamics. We can simply run this model into different islands, for example, so the, the population will evolve under different uh, uh, according to the his dynamics, but there is a migration rate also between them. So this is a, a, a nice model to build a long list of different things. And how can we, what are we doing now? What do we have to, to understand this process uh, of finite genome size? Uh, we can have a mean field approach for this problem. So we can prove 
that this product, the, the product of different allele, um, the same allele from different individuals is given by a Bernoulli random variable uh, dependent on this delta, which is a non-trivial function of the previous population, of the previous similarity matrix. And here you can recognize the, the term that appeared when you have infinite genome size. Um, this is a, a non-trivial function. And, and remember that this, the, the, the similarity between these individuals, the individual alpha and beta, is given by a sum of these random variables, uh, which are independent and are identical distributed. So this is a sum of IID random variables. And therefore, the probability distribution of the similarity is given by a binomial. So we have the binomial, we have its average, we have its, uh, its mean, its variance. And this equation also defines an algorithm that you can run. This defines what I call by a mean field algorithm. And here is a, an, a result that you can have from this algorithm. From here, we see that we start with a, an identical uh, population. So the average similarity among the population is equal to one. And then it starts to evolve. The, this dynamic is, uh, uh, is turned on. And it starts to evolve. And for small values of the genome size, it finds an equilibrium. And when we increase the genome size, it's there is this jump, there is this transition, with something really cool if you connected this to the real dynamics, because when we have small values of the genome, there is a, a, an equilibrium, and if you increase the genome, there is a transition, there's the transition of species formation. And how can we study this analytically, uh, this algorithm? We take the ensemble average of this term, which uh, it's quite hard to do, but it's not impossible. So, and then we find this new recurrence equation um, for the average similarity of the next generation in terms of the similarity from the previous generation. And however, this, it's also a function of this value P and P is the amount of the similarity distribution that remains above the threshold. So it's the probability of a, a, a given pair in your population to be to can to to be mating compatible that, that they can mate. And because of this structure that appear in this recurrence equation, there are two different possible equilibrium of this uh, in this process. And to explain what's going on, what what it means, uh, let me try to do that here. So you have your similarity distribution, it starts to run. And then when it finds the first equilibrium, you need to compute the amount of the distribution that remains above the threshold. If this amount is uh, greater than a critical value, then this is an equilibrium of the system and the evolution stops here. However, if this value is below that critical value, so this equilibrium is no longer an equilibrium of the system and the distribution starts to look for the second equilibrium and that's the, that transition that we saw in that picture. And because the variance here in this mean field approach is proportional to the one over the size of the genome, the greater the genome size, the narrower it's the distribution, then it's easier for this jump to occur because your distribution simply needs to cross the, the threshold in order to P become really small and then P will be uh, smaller than the threshold, and then there will be this transition. And to, to see that it, these things work, and here, uh, in the absence of the threshold, you can analyze the model, and here we can see that um, recover uh, the, the results that you have before for infinite genome size. Oh. And here, we can see that the mean field approach uh, describes really well what's going on uh, on the data heat dynamics. Um, and even for this variance, it's, uh, a good, um, it's a good description. And when you include the threshold, there is a, a phase transition. We can build this phase diagram. I am, I, I, I am not sure if I have time enough to explain that, so uh, I will skip it, but I can come back later. So, but there is this transition. We can compute this transition. And however, this is not the transition that's described um, by the Derrida-Hitz model. 
And here, the genome size is really small for the same set of parameters when you do this, uh, um, the dynamics with the data Higgs model. And to show what's going on here, uh, we can see that uh, while the mean, uh, while the Higgs dynamics finds its equilibrium, the mean field keeps evolving. So the mean field uh, will have found, uh, if, if it, this was the case, uh, it would have found its equilibrium uh, really far from the Derrida Higgs equilibrium. And uh, we can see that the same thing has happened for the variance. While the variance stops to evolve, it finds an equilibrium value, the Derrida Higgs dynamics keeps evolving. So this does not, exp uh, this mean field approach does not explain the, uh, the exact Derrida Higgs dynamics. And to only to, to finish my presentation, and to summarize the things that I, I told you about this model is that the Derrida Higgs is a neutral evolutionary model. So there is no fitness functions. There are no selection mechanisms. And this model presents sympatric speciation for large genome sizes. Um, you can see that we are not talking about uh, places or something like that, uh, or geographic, uh, geographic of, of these things. Um, However, we can, there's, uh, uh, there's no uh, gene flow interruption when the evolution is occurring. While the, is, the species is appearing in your process, there is no gene interruption, uh, gene flow interruption. So there's, this is a sympatric mode of speciation. Um, and however, uh, although we know that for large genome size, there is speciation, how large is large is not known yet. Um, there is a mean field approach, which I can build, which I can uh, I, I told you. And however, this mean, of, this mean field approach does not describe the Derrida Higgs transition, um, which makes this approach deserves the name of mean field because it's really good far from the transition, far from the transition, but not on the transition. And from the, the mean field approach, we learn that the amount of distribution that remains above the threshold is really important, which is something different from what we have uh, for the infinite genome size, uh, infinite genome size case, because there the only thing that we need to know is the average of the distribution. But now the mean field uh, teaches us that the variance is really important also. And we're starting now to understand why when we take average calculations, everything goes wrong. And this average calculations uh, don't work here. And we're searching for ways to escape this kind of calculation. And although this is a very, uh, this is not an easy problem, we are very optimistic that you can solve it. And thank you one more time for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, here I am.